God's been doing a lot with me, and um, and I I've been doing a lot more teaching and speaking and writing, and it's been really fun. I mean, I I recorded a record at 50. I, I I talked a little bit about that last time that I was here. I never thought I'd ever record again as long as I live, and didn't really feel the need to. I got to a certain point in my life where. Um, I don't need uh, the accolades. I don't need any of that stuff. I, I realized that I had this thing in my belly that just was kind of sour to ever record again. And so when the Lord asked me to record again, um, I got sick and almost vomited. And, um, and then the Lord started to actually talk to me about why it is that I felt that way. And I just realized that I had been in these in these brutal seasons in the recordings that had begun to label um, what I first started doing as an offering as something that was more of a requirement. And so I didn't have the joy to bring it like I used to because the way that the industry had tainted it and the way that the, the game had to be played sometimes in the middle of the music industry. I just had lost my passion to record again. And so the Lord had to revisit me and ask me to start walking in a new season, um, believing for new things, even if you were walking on the road that looked very, very familiar. And so I did it to honor God and to bless God. And I knew that God had given me a vision for what I was to record. And um, we called the album Battles, not just because I think we fight those daily. And I think that they're always with us. But because for me, in my life, I have known the mercy, the power, and um, the persistence of God in the midst of a battle, not in the midst of a celebration. I have found the most of God in the midst of the hardest places in my life. And in the times of celebration, I realized that I didn't need God as much as I needed God all those other times. As a single mom, most of you know, um, uh, when I left here in 2004, God burdened my heart with adoption. I thought I was going to do that married. God had other plans. <laughs> so I am the single mom to a now 14-year-old. I, I adopted Justice at birth. And so um, I need heaven's help to raise a teenager. I'm just saying that right now. I didn't know they were brain dead until I talked to the principal of his school. <laughs> and I was crying in front of the principal saying, I don't know how to, I don't know how to get him to do it. And she said, oh, he's brain dead. So now that I know he's full on brain dead, I'm okay. I can handle this. But um, I want to read a scripture and then I want to talk to you about this journey. I, I didn't expect God to come in the midst of, of um, um, scribing battles in a different way than I'd ever had before. Becoming a poet to, um, in, in lyrics to what I, I do, what I am known for, I'm known for worship. Um, but what I write has to matter and has to make sense to how I live. I can't just write about what I don't know, and I can't sing about what I don't feel. And so um, when, when we released that record, I had no idea and had actually no expectation for it. I was just kind of doing it as an offering, as a renewed offering to the Lord with worship. And, um, and it ended up being the best-selling record I, I have ever done in my entire career at the age of 50, which, um, give it up for the old people. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm not old, but, but I, I want to say this, and I maybe have said this the last time I was here, but I wanted to really encourage you. The Lord spoke to me in my youth and said to me, greater are the things you'll do in the latter part of your life than you'll ever do in the former. And I told God, I didn't know what he was talking about then. Because when you're young, you think you, you have the, um, the world you know, in your hands and you can do this thing. And I am finding out now that the more that I want the presence of God, the more that he offers himself to me. And the more that he entrusts to me. And so I, I want to speak today um, on my version of Seasons. Um, uh, the way God speaks seasons to me, it's, a, it's something that he really spoke 
um, after um, he heard me, I maybe for the millionth time say that I was in the longest winter of my life and it's just felt like the longest winter of my life. How many in here, just if you're honest, show of hands, have ever felt or said aloud or thought to yourself, when will the winter season of my life ever be over? And yeah, I think it's a common, it's a common thing that we do and, um, and I've spent 15 years saying that. I say 15 because um, in my head, I've counted the amount of times that this one section of my life that God hasn't answered is still attached to winter. And because God hasn't moved toward it and he hasn't settled it and he hasn't seen to it, it's, it's still a form of winter. And because that part of my life isn't something that I get up in the morning and forget about and walk through the day and forget about, it's always there like a mark on your body that you're asking for healing or something inside you you want God to heal and he doesn't do it. I was in a crisis in... Um, November of 2017 when I took a walk on Thanksgiving Day and my L5 slipped into off the disc into my nerve in my back and it felt like I had pulled a muscle um, but that muscle never got better and it never got better and it got worse and worse to the point where I could hardly even walk and so when I went in, they ordered an MRI, and they told me, your, um, your L5 has slipped into the disc because there's nothing to hold on to it, and you're going to have to have surgery. And he asked me what I did for a living, and I said, I sit at the piano and I sing. I'm on planes all the time. And he said, oh, well, yeah, that's literally destroying your spine. And so the idea that I've carried in my heart and in my um, spiritual senses that there is a cost to worship for me, there is a little, literal physical cost to what I've been doing for the past almost 25, 30 years. And so um, I've had back pain for years and years and years, and I went back to the house and I sat down and I said, I've been praying for healing and believing for healing. You are God that heals. You're going to have to heal me. And the Lord spoke to me very, very profoundly and said, I'm not going to heal you. But I invite you to go into surgery. And I invite you to enter into a season that you would not opt for, that your spirit would retaliate against, that your fear and everything would say, um, God can do this, God can do this. It's not a believing that you don't think I can do this. I'm inviting you into a different way. Would you be willing to be invited into a different way and bear that penalty or go into that cost for you to see relief? And it created a conversation with my winter, conversations about my winter with the Lord. Let me read out of Ecclesiastics a famous verse that we all know. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and then a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and then a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. And a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in his time. And so the Bible talks about seasons and change and winters and springs a lot. And I'm a creative, and I, um, what I mean by that is that um, I talked a little bit about it when I, when I was here last time, but I just believe that God can be found in anything. 
And I have this rumbling sense in my guts that every time I read scripture and I'm reading Genesis and I'm, I'm, I'm reading the way that he didn't emerge as a savior. He didn't step into the atmosphere as a father. He didn't um, come as a king in the beginning of Genesis. He came as an artist. He stepped into the abyss and he does these fascinating things with, with his power and his might by preparing a place and making a, um, making a platform for what he would do on the sixth day to walk on that platform and to actually get life out of the, that existence that he made it in the first five days. The first five days, he spends doing all of these amazing things. It doesn't take long to, to breathe life into a man. It didn't take long for him to cause a man to fall asleep and break a rib out of a man and fashion a woman. That didn't take time. It took all of his heart. But he spent the majority of the first portions of scripture creating this palette for you and I that provides us with the picture of what he first is. He is creator, creator of seasons, creator of change, creator of timelines, creator of all the things that never deviate from the plan. We will walk outside this building and everything green that we see does not compete with its other tree or the birds don't compete with the other birds. Nothing competes with each other in those first five days. The only issue that God has is the issue with man. Everything else does what it's told to do when it's told to do it based on how God has told it to do this and do that and come here and don't go any further. And that marvels me because that says to me that God is a very, very, very opinionated God of time and order. Everything's timely and orderly with the Lord. And so why my spirit or my flesh man residing in my spirit is frustrated and has friction with the timing of God, my flesh is the issue, not my spirit. My spirit can read the scriptures and understand God has a method, he has a plan, he has an order. But when he doesn't choose to come on my timeline, my flesh is irritated and begins to tell the rest of myself, that God isn't good. And so all of a sudden, we take the very thing that God instructs and has never deviated from, and we use it as metaphors to press into our spirit. And I found this out when after those surgeries, I said to the Lord, um, I have been in the longest winter of my life, 15 years, God. When are you going to change it? Like, are you ever going to change this thing? And the Holy Spirit said to me, I don't know if you remember this or not, Rita, but when I make a season, I've never made a season to last longer than the season lasts. Does winter go into June? No, God. No, it doesn't. Has it ever gone into June? No, it hasn't, God. Right, because I've commanded winter to start when it starts and ends when it ends. And it has to give way to spring because I've commanded spring to do what spring needs to do. And it's an evolving, revelatory plan that I put in place. So what you're doing is looking at the thing that I have given you in your eyes, your eyesight sees, to be the witness of what I do in your spirit. You have taken that, put it as a metaphor, capped your pain with it, and ground your timeline into a season that never lasts. And you're completely and absolutely out of my will. And... I sat there for a long time, and, and I was like, because I say it's been a long winter? He said, yeah, please do not take my season that I know is a beautiful season. If that season doesn't come, nothing in the spring will emerge. 
If that ground doesn't get frozen, certain things don't hibernate to come back to life. There is a, a plan in place that will not end because I have put a plan in place and I've put it there to show you it's not going to be the same forever. I've, I've put it there as a site for you prophetically, symbolically to also tell your spirit winter is over by March or April in some states. And then he said to me, where did I move you? I said, Dallas. And he said, does Dallas even get much of a winter? Because I had moved from Dallas to, to Dallas from Charlotte. And we had great winters in Charlotte. Sometimes we had snow and we had ice, but we had cold, chilly temperatures. And the Lord said, understand that I actually will move people into to, um, places and states and countries based on what I'm doing in them supernaturally and spiritually so that they're not in a place where the season doesn't match up with who they are. I didn't put you in a city that has a long, hard winter. Because you were supposed to come out of that 15 years ago. And you labeled yourself and you didn't do it. And so I started to really talk to God about all of this. Seasons govern the land. They bring farmers their crops. They tell farmers how to, their crops will provide. A farmer will know based on the almanac, based on looking at the solar system. I was telling um, Fernando as he picked me up from the airport that last week... For the Thanksgiving holiday, Justice and I um, had the um, opportunity to fly to South Africa. Justice is a um, American-born baby um, to African um, parents. His birth parents were on school visas in the state of Florida from Zimbabwe. The father went back to Zimbabwe while she was pregnant, and she spent the entire pregnancy in the state of Florida trying to get a hold of him because it is not cultural for Africans to just give their babies up. In Africa, there is an orphan crisis, but the orphan crisis is based on death and poverty, and most of those orphans are just stuck in the villages with their own people. There is not like an adoption system that an African, Africans are used to, and some, some uh, regions of Africa cut off international adoptions altogether because they do not want the bloodline out of the, out of the country. And they want to keep the bloodline in that country. And so for justice, his birth mother walked in five weeks before she gave birth to him. I have an American-born baby that's a full Zimbabwe baby. And so I wanted justice to be able to go with me to his homeland to actually see a place and be in a, in a place where there were more people his color than my color. I wanted him to see the Africa that I know that one day he'll be a part of. And so we, we were asked to come out. I was asked to come and do a um, songwriting event um, with a bunch of uh, well-known in that region worship and um, rap writers and uh, gospel singers and to write for them. And what they were trying to do is the segregation and the racism outside of the apartheid there is pretty intense. We have it intense still in our country, but in South Africa it is... It is their language. Racism is their language. No tribes intermingle with other tribes. In fact, they have broken off, even by color. Um, the, the Zulus in Cape Town, for the most part, are black. And then they have a race that they call colored. We don't do that here anymore, but it would be biracial people. They literally call a race of colored people. The colored people don't mix with the Zulu people. The Zulu people don't mix with the Afrikaans. And so what this this uh, event center was trying to do in a small town outside of Cape Town called Franjouk, which is the wine country, is she wanted to bring 30, 10 of each, Zulu, colored, and African together for the first time since the apartheid movement and have them actually write songs together for the church. And I was like, sign me up for that. I want to be a part of that. 
And so Justice and I went there. And I wasn't expecting, you know, they're in, their, in the beginning of their summer months there. Um, our winter is their summer, which I love that about the Lord, how he didn't put us all on the same timeline um, based on the hemisphere and the atmosphere, that there are other people experiencing things all the time, which is, as I think, a beautiful plan that we're all not in the darkness together. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thank God. But I wasn't prepared for the, almost the, um, the planting um, uh, teachings and uh, learning that I was going to get living on a vineyard. I didn't know we were going to be on a vineyard. We were on one of the most vi beautiful vineyards there in that wine country. And the owner of this place has had it in her family for years. And her husband is the winemaker. I'm not a big wine connoisseur or an alcohol connoisseur at all. Um, I've just never really drank it, never been really into it. But I love the artistry of food and how food is prepared. And, and God brought me into this place. And, and they do this absolutely stunning um, uh, speech with this wine tasting that they did one night on the vineyards. And I I didn't know this, maybe some of you know this, but the winemakers have to actually connect with scientists and solar system gurus in order to plant their seeds. Because you know, he brought up a bottle of wine and he said, this one particular Chardonnay, he, he was like, we don't get the flavor out of that Chardonnay unless we connect with the solar system in a way to know where to plant that certain Chardonnay grape on what side of the mountain for the sun to hit it at the exact time the sun needs to hit the vine, to ripen the vine, to sweeten the grape exactly the way it needs to sweeten the grape. And we've realized that in order to get the essence or the mango essence or the um, other um, uh, uh, herbal and fruit citrus um, uh, tastes in the wine, we have to know which other vines won't damage that one vine and which other things can be planted next to the vine because that vine actually infuses the grapevine with a mango scent or a floral scent to it. It was phenomenal. Like I actually broke down crying because I could feel the Holy Spirit say to me, I am a God of order. I am a God of artistry. If I care about the grape on a vine, how could I not care about your season? How could I not care about, and he's given the knowledge to men and to scientists to know how to do it. I, I, I just, I'm blown away by that kind of search for artistry, absolutely blown away by that. I mean, right now, all of us are in winter, so we, we realize that, that the, the leaves have turned, the... Um, I mean, it's not really a pretty thing here. I don't know. Sometimes um, I, when I travel, I have, have uh, been able to go in September and October and November months um, to the east. And if you've ever been to the east during the foliage change, it's absolutely stunning. Like, you will come home to Texas depressed. Because we don't really have that. And it's breathtaking. I mean, some of, some of our trees are breathtaking when they turn. But you've never seen foliage change until you've been up into the mountains or in the, the eastern regions like Virginia and um, even Washington State on the other side of the west. And it's just absolutely stunning. And there's something else I, I found out about the photosynthesis even of a leaf, that when the leaf is the greenest in spring, that is not when it's most alive and giving out the oxygen. They say that a leaf is most alive when it becomes blood red in the change of fall and it's pulsing with every color and it's just about to fall off the vine, off the branch. That's when it is the most alive, is just before it lets go and gives way. Uh, we had a, I think you guys might have experienced it too, but we had a, um, 
We had such a bad heat wave this summer. It was really, really bad. It was like 110 in Dallas. And my trees couldn't handle it. And um, when the heat wave was over, I went outside and I realized that, that it looked like fall in my, my backyard. And so I had a friend of mine who runs landscaping and I'm like, are we having an early fall? Because the, the leaves have fallen off my trees in the back. It looks like I got to call somebody to start raking them up. And she said, no, it's not early fall. It's that heat. The trees have to survive. And so in, in humid heat like that, the trees will have to gird themselves up and they will push off every dead leaf to save itself. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. She's like, no, no, no. They know how to do it. And I'm like, I, I wish that we had, I wish that we had a response to the Lord like that. But he's given us these signs all around us, these pathways and walkways all around us to see what it is. I, I want to talk a little bit about just a couple people um, in Scripture that, uh, that had issues with seasons. And, um, and I want to just kind of give this out because to withstand a season, these are things I think you have to know. It has a time limit. So if you're in a circumstance, if you're in a, a thing that you would entitle the season of your life, whatever season of your life you're in right now, it has a time limit attached to it. Because I have not seen God do anything that doesn't have a time limit attached to it. Everything that God has made speaks to us at, as who he is. So for us to say, well, God's just never going to change this. Well, I'm not sure that, that that's... The truth, if when God created the world, he created change within the world. And so I'm looking more on the sights of what the Lord has done to create the palette that I walk in saying, okay, so you actually created the palette for me to learn from so that I understood spring will be different than summer. Summer will be different than fall. Fall will be different than winter. And you offer us something in that. In fact, you offer us food in each one of those seasons. We, I'm not a hunter at all, but apparently you can only hunt for certain things in certain seasons, correct guys? And you actually now have to have a license to do it and you, you can't cut down four bears. You maybe only have the license for one, <laughs> you know, or deers or whatever it is you're doing. Because it's in those seasons that that's when that, those, those bucks and those things are the best to come out and hunt for. God has placed these seasons in our life to understand how he does it within your spirit, man. It has a time limit. Every season starts and every season ends. It's going to end things and begin things. So when a season's over, get ready for something. The Bible says... Sing a new song. Spring is coming. Now it comes. It's coming. Whether you like it or not, the season will roll over you if it has to. If you're not ready for it, it's still going to come. If you want to sleep through it, it's still going to come. You're still going to wake up and spring's going to be there and something is changing. And I think it's what God is asking us to look to what it is he's done in order for that to be a navigation system for us to say, that we've got to change. It's going to change the way things look and make way for change. I hate my backyard right now. All of the hard work that I put into that backyard is over. And now it looks disgusting and the plants are all dead and everything. And I'm hoping that the perennials all come back for the next year. But now it's my job to go in and cut off all of the dead to make ready for the new. It's my responsibility to go out there if I want the same look I had before and multiply that look because you only get better growth if you have more cutback. And so I have to be responsible to go out there and cut everything back to prepare it for what's coming in about six months. Just like the Lord's asked me to do in my own soul. If he's asking me to get rid of things, I need to get rid of things and not harbor things because I'm dragging them into seasons they should not be allowed to be in. Does that make sense? You will only see the full beauty when you respect the process. 
fighting it never helps. Your flesh will be provoked, your ability will be weakened, and your loyalty and your worship will always be questioned. How I get that is I always think about the temptation of, of Jesus. And uh, it's interesting to me, Jesus had just completed a 40-day fast, <laughs> and the devil comes to him and talks about hot bread. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's the first thing the devil says. He's just completed a 40-day fast, and he's hungry. And the devil comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, um, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answers with the written word. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil says, ah, he's using scripture. So let me use scripture against him. So there's the flesh that's always going to be provoked. And then there's the ability or the power within us that he'll always come after. The devil took him to the holy city, put him on the highest point and said, throw yourself down, Jesus, because it's written. He will command his angels concerning you. Jesus answered him and says, it is also written, don't put your Lord, the Lord your God to the test. So Jesus was wise enough to know how to comment back against, don't come after my power. Don't come after my ability. And then what does the enemy do? He comes after what he comes after. He loves to come after worship. If you, can, if you bow down and worship me, the, the, the enemy says to him, if you bow down and worship me, all of this splendor will be yours. And Jesus says, it's written, worship the Lord your God and he will you, and serve him only. And then it, the Bible says the devil left him. So when I look at that, I think, how does the enemy come? He's always after my flesh by telling my flesh, God's forgotten about you. Mary and Martha are in a crisis in scripture. Their brother is really sick. And let's just use the modern day technology or language. They send a text to Jesus. And Jesus gets the text and the text says, Lazarus, is really sick and on his deathbed get here fast and Jesus in John 11 says Lazarus is sick but I'm going to hold off for a while because it's really hard for Jesus sometimes to meet us in our season that has nothing to do with it but it bothers our flesh to know that he doesn't come right away and how many of us have been in this place where we've texted Christ, but he's never shown up? Where we've called out for him and called out for him and called out for him. Heal me, heal me, heal me. Can't you see what I do? Heal me, heal me. And finally the Lord comes and says, can I heal you my way? And would you come into the invitation of what I have to offer you? It says in John 11, Jesus says, it is for your sake that I hold myself off so that my Father's glory may be revealed in the perfect time. So does the glory of God settle on the perfect timing of God. According to scripture, it does. Jonah finds himself in a predicament, which I think the, the book of Jonah is in the scripture for leadership in the church. He's a minor prophet, but as a minor prophet, he's asked by God to go to a city that it takes three days to go around with 160 something thousand people in it and tell them God's, gonna, God's done with them. I'm prophetic, but I've never had the Lord ask me to do that. So even in a minor prophet, that's a pretty huge task, which says to us as the readers that Jonah was a big deal. If he was asked to do that, Jonah was trusted by God. He was, he was given the authority by God to do it. But Jonah finds himself in a season of regret, anxiety, and he is angry. I don't know how he got there, but Jonah's biggest mistake is found in a place 
where in the beginning of Jonah chapter 1, it says, um, the Lord says to him, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down to it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So for me, the problem isn't Tarshish. The problem is the road to Joppa. What happened from the decision that he has to get on the road to Joppa? The season in his life that he could not relinquish or give over to the Lord, that in the end of that chapter, when God has compassion, Jonah says this, it displeased the Lord in Jonah chapter 4. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die and to live. God, you've done what you say you'll do. Didn't I tell you you'd have compassion on people? and heal them all, and tell them all that you loved them anyway. Didn't I go ahead and tell you that's what you would do? You would make me look stupid. So why don't you just kill me now? It takes somebody living in a, in a really traumatic winter that will not relent, that will not change, that will not move forward, that will not, you don't just get there overnight. You marinate in doubt. You marinate in unbelief. You marinate in rage. You marinate in rebellion. You marinate in anger toward God. You marinate in that stuff. That's in your bones to get you in a place where you don't even know how to proceed to the next season. I, I love Mary's song. Mary to me is, especially in this season, um, Mary is this 14-year-old girl who, who is visited by an angel and um, has this beautiful, beautiful thing said to her, but this weighty, costly, incredibly difficult task. He shows up to a 14-year-old. I can't imagine my kid taking this on at, at all. I can't imagine my kid's response to be anything like this. But here is a woman who's 14 and hasn't even walked through many seasons of her life. But God places on her the timing of a season that she's now going to carry. And for her as a mother, she's, she realizes it's probably not going to end well. But her response in the middle of being given a season and a weight to carry, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. How do you align yourself in the season of God? How do you give yourself over to the season of God? I, I want to um, close here by just giving you this one little revelation and, and maybe just praying over your season. For me, when I had that conversation with the Lord, I said, how do I break it off my life? If I've, if I've embedded myself in a season of winter because of this, this, and this, which are pretty big calls, have not been answered. But you won't let me lay them down because you haven't asked me to lay them down. So the weight of it is that I have to, to, to walk out the timing of God, not knowing when you're ever going to do it. Not knowing when you're ever going to change it. Some of you pray for lost family members. And it seems like it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Some of you pray for people that are sick. It doesn't feel like God's changing anything. Sometimes you'll have a moment and sometimes all of a sudden you'll be right back in. And I looked at scripture and I realized that it says in Genesis that um, the first thing that God does is he separates light and dark. And he makes space for light and he makes space for dark. And he calls it the light and he calls it the dark. 
But have you ever noticed that he doesn't ever do anything with the sun and the moon until the fourth day? He doesn't create the sun and he doesn't create the moon to govern those hemispheres until the fourth day. And so my question to the Lord was, what is night and day to you? What was it before we needed the sun by day and the moon by night to guide us? What was it to you? And, and there's a reminding out of Revelations 22.5 that says, um, we don't need a candle or a light of the sun for the Lord God shall illuminate them, which says in the last days we will see why he gave us the sun and the moon to govern us, but also to show us a part of the illuminating of who he is. He hasn't left you. He hangs in the sky Part of the essence of God hangs in the sky to call your day day and hangs on the moon to call your night night. He has not missed anything. I want to end before the, the worship team and Johnny can just sing over us, but I, I want to end with the lyrics of a song that I, I love. I don't sing it much. I, I usually just sit there and, and lay under it. But it's a song called Seasons from Hillsong, and some of you probably have heard it, but I'm just going to read you these lyrics. Like the frost on a rose, winter comes for us all, and oh how nature acquaints us with the nature of patience. Like a seed in the snow, I've been buried to grow, for your promise is loyal from seed to sequoia. Though the winter is long, even richer, the harvest it brings, Though my waiting prolongs even greater, your promise for me like a seed, I believe that my season will come. Lord, I think of your love like the low winter sun. As I gaze, I am blinded in the light of your brightness. Like a fire to the snow, I'm renewed in your warmth. Melt the ice of this wild soul till the barren is beautiful. I can see the promise I can see the future. You're the God of seasons. I'm just in the winter. If all I know of harvest is all that's worth my patience, then if you're not done working, God, I'm not done waiting. You can see the promise. I don't know where you are in your season, but I just want to pray over you. If you have been in winter for a long time and need God to break, then my suggestion is today that you ask the Lord to change your verbiage and to realize that when winter's over, it's over. And maybe the circumstance is still there, but your spirit man can rise up over that and say, it's no longer winter, soul. So even though that circumstance may still be lingering, my spirit will say, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, and you no longer live in that space. So if that's you today, I just want to pray for you. If you find yourself trapped in a season, I just want you to stand. I'm just going to pray over you and pray that God begins to break and melt the ice of your season, especially when we're in the winter months. I think it's imperative for us to see and really acknowledge, okay, we're given this three more months. We're given this four more months. And then God's going to do something in our spirit. And God's going to be able to take our spirit man. And you're going to be able to mimic the seasons that God has given us to say, Behold, winter is over and the spring has come. So Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would take the months and the years and the decades of things that have been on in our life that have attached themselves like a frozen branch, that have labeled itself winter when you have been trying to merge us into different seasons, but we won't go because you haven't addressed that thing. You haven't healed that thing. You haven't spoken to that thing. We've called out to you, but you haven't come. And we have thought, God, you must not care about this, that maybe you just want us trapped in winter. Maybe you just want us trapped in this place. And God, we're asking for a, um, a re reconstruction of our viewpoint. We go back to the beginning and say, God, that's not how you designed it. 
And we ask you to forgive us for speaking over our our issues, for speaking over our, our seasons and crushing our seasons and labeling our seasons with a permanency in that season that you have not designed. And God, I even pray right now that you would break off the ice that has become thick over us in our seasons of dismay, our seasons of of delay, our seasons of anguish, our seasons of sickness, our seasons of family struggles and relationship. God, our seasons of financial plight and all the things that come along with the household and jobs. God, would you begin to reconstruct our lives to look the way you created the seasons to look. It has a time limit on it. And we speak, behold, the winter will be over in Jesus' name. We thank you and we worship you, God.